Chapter 9, The Return to the Valley When Cortez saw that he possessed such a goodly store of muskets and powder and crossbows, and realized the strong desire of all of us, both captains and soldiers, again to attack the great city of Mexico, he decided to ask the caciques of Tlaxcala to give him ten thousand Indian warriors to join us on an expedition to Texcoco, which, after Mexico, is one of the largest cities in the whole of New Spain. Jicotenga the Elder promptly said that he would give him, with the utmost willingness, not only ten thousand men, but many more if he chose to take them, and that another valiant cacique, our great friend Chichimecatecla, would go as their captain. On the day after the Feast of the Nativity in the year 1520, we began our march and slept at Tesmelucon, a pueblo subject to Tlaxcala, and the people of the town gave us what we needed. From there onward, it was Mexican territory, and we went more cautiously, for it was well known in Mexico and Texcoco that we were marching toward their city. That day, we met no obstacles whatever and camped at the foot of the Sierra, a march of about three leagues. The night was very cold but we got through it safely thanks to our patrols and scouts. When the dawn came, we began to ascend a small pass, and in some difficult places like Barrancas, the hillside had been cut away so we could not pass, and many pine trees and other timber had been placed across the track. But having so many friendly Tlaxcalans with us, a clearing was soon made, and sending a company of musketeers and crossbowmen in advance, we marched on with the utmost caution our allies cutting and pushing aside trees to enable the horsemen to pass, until we got to the top of the range. Then we descended a little and caught sight of the Lake of Mexico and its great city standing in the water, and when we saw it we gave great thanks to God for allowing us to see it again. We descended to the mountain to where we saw great smoke signals, and marching onward we came upon a large squadron of Mexican and Texcocan warriors, who were waiting for us at a pass through the rocky thicket where there was an apparently broken down wooden bridge and a deep gulch and a waterfall below it. However, we soon defeated the squadron and passed in perfect safety. To hear the shouts that they gave from the farms and from the barrancas, however, they did nothing else, and shouted only from places where the horsemen could not reach them. Our friends the Tlaxcalans carried off fowls and whatever else they could steal, and they did not abstain from this, although Cortez had ordered them not to make war on the people if they were not attacked. The Tlaxcalans answered that if the people were well disposed and peaceable, they would not come out on the road and attack us, as they did at the passage of the Barranca and the bridge, where they tried to stop our advance. We went to sleep that night at Coatepec, a deserted pueblo subject to Texcoco, and took every precaution lest we should be attacked during the darkness. As soon as dawn came, we began our march towards Tetcoco, which was about two leagues distant from where we slept. However, we had not advanced half a league when we saw our scouts returning at a breakneck pace and looking very cheerful, and they told Cortez that ten Indians were approaching, unarmed, and carrying golden devices and banners, and that yells and shouts no longer came from the huts and farms they had passed on the road as it happened the day before. Then Cortez ordered a halt until seven Indian chieftains, natives of Texcoco, came up to us. They carried a golden banner and a long lance, and before reaching us they lowered the banner and knelt down, which is a sign of peace. And when they came before Cortez, who had our interpreter standing by him, they said, Malinche, our lord and chieftain of Texcoco, Coanacotzin, sends to beg you to receive him into your friendship, and he is awaiting you peaceably in the city, and in proof thereof accept his banner of gold, and he begs as a favor that you will order your Tlaxcalans and your brethren not to do any harm to his land, and that you will come and lodge in the city where he will provide you with all that you need. Moreover, they said that the troops, which had been stationed in the ravines and bad passes, did not belong to Texcoco, but were Mexicans sent by Guatemoc. When the message had been considered, Cortez at once sent for the Tlaxcalan captains and ordered them, in the most friendly way, not to do any damage nor to take anything whatever in this country, because peace had been made, and they did as he told them. But he did not forbid them taking food, if it were only maize and beans, even fowls and dogs, of which there was an abundance, all the houses being full of them. Then Cortez took counsel with his captains, and it seemed to them that all this begging for peace was a trick, for if it had been true, it would not have been done so suddenly, and they would have been brought food. Nevertheless, Cortez accepted the banner, which was worth about eighty pesos, and thanked the messengers and said to them, 
that he was not in the habit of doing evil or damage to any vassals of his majesty, and if they kept the peace which they had announced, he would protect them against the Mahicans, that as they might have seen, he had already ordered the Tlashkalans not to do any damage in their country, and they would avoid doing so for the future, although they knew how in that city or forty Spaniards are brethren. Two hundred Tlashkalans have been killed at the time when we were leaving Mexico, and many loads of gold and other spoil which belonged to them had been stolen, that he must beg their chieftain Kuanakotzin and the other chiefs and captains of Tishkoko to restore to us the gold and the cloths, but as to the death of the Spaniards there was no remedy for it, for he would therefore not ask them for any. The messengers replied that they would report to their lord as he ordered them to do, but that he who had ordered the Spaniards to be killed and who took all the spoil was a chieftain named Quitlawak, who had been chosen king of Mexico after Montezuma's death, and that they took him in Mexico nearly all the tools, and they had promptly been sacrificed to Ichilobos. When Cortes heard that reply, he made no answer, lest he should lose his temper or threaten them, but he bade them Godspeed. One of the ambassadors remained in our company, and we went on to a suburb of Texcoco called Coatlinchan, and there they gave us plenty to eat and all that we had need of. And we cast down some idols that were in the houses where we lodged, and early the next day we went to the city of Texcoco. In none of the streets nor houses did we see any women, boys, or children, only terrified-looking men. We took up our quarters in some great rooms and halls, and Cortez at once summoned the captains and most of us soldiers, and told us not to leave the precincts of the great courts, and to keep well on the alert until we could see how things were going, for it did not seem to him that the city was friendly. He ordered Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid and some other soldiers, and me among them, to ascend the great queue which was very lofty, and to look from the lofty queue over the city and the lake, and what we saw was that all the inhabitants were moving off with their goods and chattels, and women and children, some to the hills and others to the reed thickets in the lake, and that the lake was thronged with canoes, great and small. As soon as Cortez knew this, he wanted to capture the Lord of Texcoco who had sent him the golden banner, and when certain priests whom Cortez sent his messengers went to summon him, he had already placed himself in safety, for he was the very first to flee to Mexico with many other chieftains. We passed that night with great precautions, and very early the next day Cortez ordered all the Indian chieftains who had remained in Texcoco to be summoned before him. For as it was a very large city, there were many other chieftains of the parties opposing the cacique who had fled, with whom there had been discussions and disputes about the command and the kingship of that city. When they came before Cortez, he learned from them how, in sense, when Coanacotzin had ruled over the city, they told him that Coanacotzin, in his desire to seize the power, had infamously killed his elder brother, Quiquilquatzin, with the assistance given him for that purpose by Quitlawak, the Prince of Mexico, the one that made war on us when we were fleeing after the death of Montezuma. Furthermore, there were among them other lords who had a better right to the kingdom of Texcoco than he who now held it, and that it should go to a youth who at that time became a Christian with much religious pomp, and was named Don Hernando Cortes, for our captain was his godfather. They said that this youth was the legitimate son of Nezahualpili, the lord and king of Texcoco, and presently, without any further delay, and with the greatest festive celebration and rejoicing throughout Texcoco, they appointed him their natural lord and king, with all the ceremonies which they were accustomed to render to their so-called kings, and in perfect peace, and with the love of all his vassals, and of the neighboring towns, he governed absolutely and was obeyed for his better instruction in the manners of our faith, and to improve his manners, and so that he should learn our language, Cortez ordered that he should have his tutors Antonio de Villarreal and Bachelor of Arts named Escobar. Cortez then asked for a large force of Indian laborers to broaden and deepen the canals and ditches through which we were to draw the launches to the lake when they were finished and ready to sail. He also explained to Don Hernando himself and the other chieftains what was the reason and purpose in having the launches built and how we were going to blockade Mexico. Don Hernando offered all the assistance within his power and of his own accord promised to send messengers to all the neighboring pueblos and tell them to become vassals of his majesty and accept our friendship and authority against Mexico. After spending twelve days in Texcoco, the Tlaxcalans had exhausted their provisions, and they were so numerous that the people of Texcoco were unable to furnish them with sufficient food. 
as we were unwilling that they should become a burden to the people of Texcoco, and as the Tlaxcalans themselves were most desirous of fighting the Mexicans and avenging the deaths of the many Tlaxcalans who had been killed and offered as sacrifices during their past defeats, Cortes determined that we should set out on our march to Itzapalapa with himself as commander-in-chief and with André de Tapia, Cristobal de Olid, and thirteen horsemen, twenty crossbowmen, six musketeers, and two hundred and twenty soldiers, and our Tlaxcalan allies, besides twenty chieftains from Texcoco given us by Don Hernando. I have already said that more than half the houses in Itzapalapa were built in the water, and the other half on dry land. We kept on our way in good order, and as the Mexicans always held watchmen and garrisons and warriors ready to oppose us and to reinforce any of their towns, when they knew that we were going to attack them, they warned the people of Itzapalapa to be prepared, and sent over eight thousand Mexicans to help them. Like good warriors, they awaited our coming on dry land, and for a good while they fought very bravely against us. Then the horsemen broke through their ranks, followed by the crossbows and muskets, and all our Tlaxcalan allies who charged on them like mad dogs, and the enemy quickly abandoned the open ground and took refuge in the town. However, they had arranged a stratagem, and this was the way they did it. They fled and got into the canoes which were in the water, and into the houses which stood on the lake. Others retired among the reeds, and as it was a dark night, they gave us a chance to take up quarters in the town, well contented with the spoil we had taken and still more with the victory we had gained. While we were in this situation, when we least expected it, such a flood of water rushed to the whole town that the chieftains whom we had brought from Texcoco had not cried out and warned us to get out of the houses to dry land as quickly as we could. We should all have been drowned, for the enemy had burst open the canals of fresh and salt water and torn down a causeway so that the water rose up all of a sudden. As our allies, the Tlaxcalans, were not accustomed to water and did not know how to swim, two of them were drowned, and we, at great risk to our lives, all thoroughly drenched and with our powder spoilt, managed to get out without our belongings, and in that condition, very cold and without any supper, we passed a bad night. Worst of all were the jeers and the shouts and whistles which the people of Itzapalapa and the Mexicans uttered from their houses and canoes. However, there was still a worse thing to happen to us, for as they knew in Mexico about the plan that had been made to drown us by breaking down the causeway and canals, we found waiting for us on land and in the lake many battalions of warriors, and as soon as day dawned, they made such an attack on us that we could hardly bear up against it, but they did not defeat us, although they killed two soldiers and one horse, and wounded many both of us and the Tlaxcalans, Little by little the attack slackened, and we returned to Texcoco, half ashamed of the trick and stratagem to throw us into the water, and also because we gained very little credit in the battle they fought against us afterwards, as our powder was exhausted. Nevertheless, it frightened them, and they had enough to do in burying and burning their dead, and curing their wounds and rebuilding their houses. When we had been two days in Texcoco after our return from the expedition of Itzapalapa, Three pueblos came peacefully to Cortes to beg pardon for the past wars and the deaths of Spaniards whom they had killed. As Cortes saw that there was nothing else to be done at the time, he pardoned them, but he gave them a severe reprimand, and they bound themselves by many promises always to be hostile to the Mexicans and to be the vassals of his majesty and to serve us. And so they did. About the same time the inhabitants of the pueblo named Mixwick which is also called Venezuela, which stands in the lake, came to beg for peace and friendship. These people had apparently never been on good terms with Mexicans, and in their hearts they detested them. Cortes and all of us were greatly pleased at these people coming to seek our friendship, because their pueblo was in the lake, and through them we hoped to get at their neighbors who were likewise established on the water. So Cortes thanked them greatly, and dismissed them with promises and gentle speeches. While this was taking place, they came to tell Cortes the great squadrons of Mexicans were advancing on the four pueblos, which had been the first to seek our friendship. One named Coatlinchan, and others whose names I forget, and they told Cortes that they did not dare to stay in their houses, and that they wished to flee to the mountains, or to come to Texcoco, where we were, and they said so many things to Cortes to induce him to help them, that he promptly got ready twenty horsemen and two hundred soldiers, thirteen crosswomen, and ten musketeers, 
and took with him Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid and went to the Pueblos, a distance from Texcoco of about two leagues. It appeared to be true that the Mexicans had sent to threaten them and warn them that they would be destroyed for accepting our friendship, but the point of dispute over which they uttered the worst threats concerned some large maize plantations lying near the lake, which were ready for the harvest, whence the people of Texcoco were providing our camp. The Mexicans wanted to take the maize, for they said that it was theirs, for it had been the custom of those four pueblos to sow and harvest the maize plantations on that plain for the priests of the Mexican idols. Over this question of the maize field, many Indians had been killed. When Cortez understood about it, he promised the people that when the time came for them to go and gather maize, he would send a captain and many horsemen and soldiers to protect those who went to fetch it. They were well pleased with what Cortez had said to them, and he returned to Texcoco. From that time forward, whenever we had need of maize in our camp, we mustered the Indian warriors from all those towns, and with our Tlaxcalan allies and ten horsemen, and a hundred soldiers with some musketeers and crossbowmen, we went after the maize. I say this because I went twice for it myself, and on one occasion we had a capital skirmish with some powerful Mexican squadrons, which had come in more than a thousand canoes, and awaited us in the maize fields, and as we had our allies with us, although the Mexicans fought like brave men, we made them take to their canoes. But they killed one of our soldiers and wounded twelve, and they also wounded some flash cannons. But the enemy had not much to brag about, for fifteen or twenty of them were lying dead, and we carried off five of them as prisoners. The next day we heard the news that the people of Chalco and Tlamanto and their dependencies wished to make peace but on account of the Mexican garrison stationed in their towns, they had no opportunity to do so, and that these Mexicans did much damage in their country and took their women, especially if they were handsome. We had also heard that the timber for building the launches had been cut and prepared at Tlaxcala, and as the time was passing and none of the timber had yet been brought to Texcoco, most of the soldiers were a great deal worried about it. Then, in addition to this, the people came from the Pueblo of Mishquic and from other friendly pueblos to tell Cortez that the Mexicans were coming to attack them because they had accepted our friendship. Moreover, some of our friends, the Tlaxcalans, who had already grabbed clothing and salt and gold and other spoil, wished to return home, but they did not dare to do so because the road was not safe. When Cortez found that to succour some of those towns that clamoured for help and to give assistance to the people of Chalco as well would make it impossible to give security to either one or the other, he decided to put aside all other matters and, first of all, go to Chalco and Talamanalco. For that purpose, he sent Gonzalo de Sandoval and Francisco de Lugo with fifteen horsemen and two hundred soldiers and musketeers and crossbowmen and our Tlaxcalan allies, with orders by all means to break up and disperse the Mexican garrisons and to drive them out of Chalco and Tlamanalco and leave the road to Tlaxcala quite clear, so that no one could come and go to Villarica without any molestation for the Mexican warriors. As soon as this was arranged, he sent some Texcocan Indians very secretly to Chalco to advise the people about it, so that they might be fully prepared to follow the Mexican garrison either by day or by night. As they wished for nothing better, the people of Chalco kept thoroughly prepared. When Gonzalo de Sandoval marched with his army, he left a rear guard of five horsemen and as many crossbowmen to protect the large number of the Tlaxcalans, who were laden with the spoil that they had seized. The Mexicans knew that our people were marching on Chalco, and had got together many squadrons of warriors who fell on the rear guard where the Tlaxcalans were marching with the spoil, and punished them severely and our five horsemen and the crossbowmen could not hold out against them, for two of the crossbowmen were killed and the others were wounded, and although Gonzalo de Sandoval promptly turned round on the enemy and defeated them and killed ten Mexicans, the lake was so nearby that the enemy managed to take refuge in the canoes in which they had come. When the enemy had been put to flight and Sandoval saw that the five horsemen in the rear guard with the musketeers and crossbowmen were wounded, both they and their horses, and that two crossbowmen were dead and the others wounded. Although, I repeat, he saw all this, he did not fail to say to them that they were not worth much for not having been able to resist the enemy and defend themselves and our allies, and that he was very angry with them. They were from among those who had lately come from Spain, and he told them that it was very clear that they did not know what fighting was like, 
Then he placed in safety all the Tlaxcalan Indians with their spoil, and he also dispatched some letters which Cortez was sending to Villarica. In these, Cortez told the captain, who had remained in command there, that if there were any soldiers who were disposed to take part in the fighting, that he should send them to Tlaxcala, but that they should not go beyond that town until the roads were safer, for they would run great risk. When the messengers had been dispatched and the Tlaxcalan sent off to their homes, Sandoval turned towards Chalco. As he marched on, he saw many squadrons of Mexicans coming against him, and on a level plain where there were large plantations of maize and magüe, they attacked him fiercely with darts, arrows, and stones from slings, and long lances with which to kill the horses. When Sandoval saw such a host of warriors opposed to him, he cheered on his men and twice broke through the ranks of the enemy, and with the aid of the muskets and crossbows, and the few allies who had stayed with him, he defeated them, although they wounded five soldiers and six horses, and many of our allies. However, he had fallen on them so quickly and with such fury that he made them pay well for the damage they had first done. When the people of Chalco knew that Sandoval was near, they went out to receive him on the road with much honor and rejoicing. In that defeat, eight Mexicans were taken prisoner, three of them chieftains of importance. When all this had been done, Sandoval said that on the following day he wished to return to Texcoco, and the people of Chalco said they wanted to go with him to see and speak to Malinche, and take with them the two sons of the lord of that province who had died of smallpox a few days before, and before dying had charged all his chieftains and elders to take his sons to see the captain, so that by his hand they might be installed lords of Chalco, and that all should endeavor to become subjects of the great king of the Tools for it was quite true that his ancestors had told him that men with beards who came from the direction of the sunrise would govern these lands, and from what he had seen we were those men. Sandoval soon returned with all his army to Texcoco, and took in his company and the sons of the Lord of Chalco and the other chieftains, and the eight Mexican prisoners and Cortez was overjoyed at his arrival. The caciques presented themselves at once before Cortez, and after having paid him every sign of respect, they told him of the willingness with which they would become vassals of his majesty, as their father had commanded them to do, and begged that they might receive the chieftainship from his hands. When they had made their speeches, they presented Cortez with rich jewels worth about two hundred pesos de oro. When Cortez thoroughly understood what they had said, he showed them much kindness and embraced them, and under his hand gave the lordship of Chalco to the elder brother with more than half of the subject pueblos, and those of Tlalmenalco and Chimal he gave to the younger brother together with Ayotzingo and other subject pueblos. Cortez begged the chieftains to wait in Texcoco for two days, as he was about to send a captain to Tlaxcala for the timber and planking, who would take them in his company and conduct them to their country so that the Mexicans should not attack them on the road. For this they thanked him greatly and went away well contented. Let us stop talking about this and say how Cortez decided to send to Mexico the eight prisoners whom Sandoval had captured in the rout at Chalco to tell the prince named Guatemoc, whom the Mexicans had then chosen as king, how greatly he desired to avoid being the cause of his ruin, and that of so great a city. He therefore begged them to sue for peace, and he would pardon them for the losses and deaths which had suffered and would ask nothing for them. He reminded Guatemoc that it is easy to remedy a war in the beginning, but very difficult towards the middle and at the end, and that it would end in their destruction, and how could Guatemoc desire all his people to be slain and his city destroyed? He should bear in mind the great power of our Lord God in whom we behave and whom we worship, and who always helps us, and he should always remember that all the pueblos in the neighborhood were now on our side, that the Lash Collins had no wish but for war, in order to avenge the deaths of their compatriots. Let the Mexicans lay down their arms and make peace, and he, Cortez, would promise them that he would always treat them with great honor. Doña Marina and Aguilar made use of many other sound arguments, and gave them good advice on the subject. Those eight Indians went before Guatemoc, but he refused to send any answer whatever, and went on making dikes and gathering stores, and sent into all the provinces in order that if any of us could be captured straying, we should be brought to Mexico to be sacrificed, and that when he sent to summon them, they should come at once with their arms, and he sent to remit and free them from much of their tribute. 
as we were always longing to get the launches finished and to begin the blockade of Mexico, our Captain Cortez, so as not to waste time to no purpose, ordered Gonzalo de Sandoval to go for the timber and to take with him 200 soldiers, 20 musketeers and crossbowmen, 15 horsemen and a large company of Tlaxcalans, as well as 20 chieftains from Texcoco, also to take in his company the youths and the elders from Chalco and to place them in safety in their towns. Before they set out, Cortez established a friendship between the Tlaxcalans and the people of Chalco. Cortez also ordered Gonzalo de Sandoval to go to a pueblo subject to Texcoco, where more than 40 soldiers of the followers of Narve and some of our own men and many Tlaxcalans had been killed, and the people had also stolen three loads of gold, which we were turned out of Mexico. Before our soldiers arrived at this pueblo, the people already knew through their spies that they were coming down on them, and they abandoned the pueblo and fled to the hills, and Sandoval followed them and killed only three or four of them, for he felt pity for them. But they took some women and girls and captured four chieftains. Much blood of the Spaniards who had been killed was found on the walls of the temple in that pueblo, for they had sprinkled their idols with it, and Sandoval also found two faces which had been flayed, and the skin tanned like skin for gloves. The beards were left on, and they had been placed as offerings upon one of the altars. There were also found four tanned skins of horses, very well preserved, with the hair on and the horseshoes, and they were hung up before the idols in the great queue. There were also found many garments of the Spaniards who had been killed, hung up as offerings to these same idols, and on the pillar of a house where they had been imprisoned, there was found written with charcoal, here was imprisoned the unfortunate Juan Uste and many others whom I brought in my company. This Juan Uste was a gentleman and was one of the persons of quality whom Narve had brought with him. Sandoval and all his soldiers were moved to pity by all this, and it grieved them greatly. But how could the matter now be remedied except by being merciful to the people of the Pueblo? However, they had fled and would not wait, and had taken their women and children with him. A few women who were captured wept for their husbands and fathers, and when Sandoval saw this, he liberated four chieftains whom he had captured, and all of the women, and sent them to summon the inhabitants of the Pueblo, who came and begged for pardon, and gave their fealty to his majesty, and promised always to oppose the Mexicans, and to serve us well, with all possible affection and goodwill. When they asked about the gold they had stolen from the Tlaxcalans who passed that way, the people replied that they had taken three loads of it from them, but the Mexicans and the lords of Texcoco had carried it off, for they said that the gold had belonged to Montezuma, who, when he was a prisoner, had taken it from the temples and given it to Malinche. So Sandoval went on his way towards Tlaxcala, and when near the capital where the caciques reside, he met eight thousand men carrying on their backs all the timber and boards of the launches, and as many more men with their arms and plumes acting as a guard, and two thousand others who brought food and relieved the carriers. There came as commanders of the whole force of Tlaxcalans, Chichimecatecla, and all came in the charge of Martin Lopez, who was the master carpenter who cut the timber and gave the model and dimensions for the boards. When Sandoval saw them approaching, he was delighted that they had relieved him from his task, for he expected to be detained some days in Tlaxcala, waiting for them to get off with all the timber and planking. In the same order in which they came up to us, we accompanied them for two days until we entered Mexican territory. The Mexicans whistled and shouted from their farms and from the barrancas and from other places where we could do them no harm, either with our horsemen or our muskets. Then Martin Lopez said that it would be as well to change the order in which they had hitherto marched from the Tlaxcalans, had told him they feared that the powerful forces of Mexico might make a sudden attack in that part of the road, and might defeat them, as they were so heavily laden and hampered by the timber and food they were carrying. So Sandoval at once divided the horsemen and musketeers and crossbowmen, so that some should go in advance and others on the flanks, and he ordered Chichimecatecla to take charge of the Lashcalans, who were to march behind as a rear guard with Gonzalo de Sandoval himself. The cacique was offended at this, thinking that they did not consider him a brave man, but they said so much to him on that point that he became reconciled, seeing that Sandoval himself was to remain with him, and that he was given to understand that the Mexicans always made their attacks on the baggage which was kept towards the rear. When he clearly understood this, he embraced Sandoval and said that he felt honored by what had been done. 
Another two days' march brought them to Teshkoko, and before entering the city they put on very fine cloaks and plumes and marched in good order to the sound of drums and trumpets, and in an unbroken line they were half a day marching into the city, shouting, whistling, and crying out, Viva! Viva for the Emperor, our Lord, and Castile! Castile and Tlaxcala! Tlaxcala! From that time forward, the greatest dispatch was used in building the thirteen launches. Martin Lopez was the master builder, aided by other Spaniards and two blacksmiths with their forges, and some Indian carpenters, and all worked with the greatest speed until the launches were put together, and they only needed to be caulked, and their masts, rigging, and sails to be set up. I want to say how great were the precautions that we took in our camp while this was being done. In the matter of spies and scouts and guards for the launches, for they lay near the lake, and three times the Mexicans tried to set them on fire, and we even captured fifteen of these Indians, who had come to set fire to them, and from these men Cortez learned fully what was being done in Mexico and what Guatemoc was planning and it was that they would never make peace, but would either all die fighting or kill every one of us. I wish now to mention the summonses and messengers that the Mexicans sent to all their subject pueblos, and how they remitted their tribute, and the work that they carried on both by day and night, of digging ditches and deepening the passages beneath the bridges, and making strong entrenchments, and preparing their darts and dart-throwers, and making very long lances with which to kill the horses, to which were attached the swords that they had captured from us on the night of our defeat. Let us also speak of the canal and trench by which the launches were to go out to the great lake, for it was already very broad and deep, so that the ships of considerable size were able to float in it, for as I have already said, there were 8,000 Indians always employed in the work.